Start your Bibles. Start them. Vroom, vroom. Start them uh, in Philippians chapter 2. Now we're going to try to finish off this thing about, uh, well, I guess we'll go for a little longer in the reality of Christ crucified and its emphasis. But I want to say this to everybody in this room and anybody watching or listening, that we are on the verge of getting into the main part, the part that I felt to say from the very beginning that it may be the most important class I've ever taught. You may not see it as that as quickly as, as you would hope, but I'm saying this based on two years of searching the scriptures and finding out that Philippians is the grand teller of the story and the other places are the grand uh, manifestation of the story. So, uh, uh, obviously, there's a good chance I won't be here next week. But, the, but if I'm not, then the week after that, we surely will get into the most important part. All right, let me, uh, let me see where we're at here. Um, start by reading a few little things here, if possible. Um, Christ was the pattern, and, and as his body, we should give ourselves to others in the same way that Christ was self-giving to us. Now, where, where do we get that concept from? Well, we get it from Philippians 2, 1 and 2. If there be any, you know, if you've experienced any consolation in Christ, if there's been any comfort of this love, this self-giving love, if any fellowship of the Spirit in this reality, if any tender mercies and compassion, fulfill you my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, one mind. Let this mind, of course, verse 5, let this mind be in you. So he's saying, if you've gotten any benefits out of, Christ crucified, I'm asking you to have the same mind that he had when he gave himself, that you start having that, working in you towards others. That's, that's where that came from. And so as his body, it's, 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 see, it's not just an exhortation to a bunch of individuals who have become Christian. It is an explanation of who you are as his body, by his life. Does that make sense to anybody? In other words, it's the life that produces these things, and the life is Christ, not the body. The body is the vehicle of manifestation, not the vehicle of initiation. That's profound. Write that down. And then put this on YouTube. I'm kidding. Which, by the way, I really don't want any ever private pictures of myself taken or known and put up on Facebook or YouTube or Twitter or Slither or any of those. Um, I would rather you not do that, okay? You say, well, why? It's just social media. Because, because I just don't want it to happen. It's, it's, it's already up there. <laughs> Somebody said, why don't you ever go by the post office and pick up the mail? I said, because of the posters. <laughs> All right. So um, Paul saw the cross as the way God chose to express love, and Jesus told us to love one another as he loved us. Now, this is very difficult right now because all of my notes and all the stuff that I have on this reality of of the cross being the expression of God's love, it's nothing like what we think because we, we view the cross as the expression of God's love for us. Well, it includes us, but it's just the way God expresses love. Really? Really, I, I'm telling you the truth. I mean, I know it makes us feel fuzzy and warm and all toasty, but God is love. He didn't do love for you. I mean, he is that. He is that whether it involves you or your enemies. 
<laughs> I mean, let's just accept him as he is and stop making everything so personal. Well, it's a personal salvation. Truth is, it's not even a personal salvation. You had a personal experience, but we were raised, we were crucified with him together, and we were raised up together and made to sit together in heavenly place. There's nothing personal about that. You're with a big group of people. Amen? I mean, that all happened to the to those who would be his body, not he in other words, he didn't rip a finger out of the earth and resurrect it. You know, and then another member goes. Pew! And then another one, you know. Well, it's all personal. It is a personal, and so before you either cry or attack me, yes, you must have a personal encounter with Christ and personally ask him in your heart. Of course, I'm not taking that away from you. Hold that. Don't ever let it go. However, it's not a personal salvation. It is, it, that, that's a personal acceptance of a very non-personal salvation, meaning not that it doesn't, well, meaning that it includes way more than you and it happened with way more than you and I. All right, I won't belabor that. You say, you already have. <laughs> okay, so he saw the cross as the way God chose to express love. Now. Not, again, not love for you, but the, the full picture of, of the description of God love is a cross. All right. Remember last class we talked about the lamb? We had a, we had a good time, didn't we? Wasn't that good? Okay. But this thought also came to me back then. I was, you know, talking to the Lord when I was in Bible school and just learning things and everything. I said, Lord, why, why did Jesus have to die on a cross so violently and so bad and everything? You know, why couldn't we just see him and his goodness as he walked the earth and did good things for people? And I felt like the Lord said to me that, he said, if the cross never happened, you would never really, really know what God is like. You, or, or can I say it like this? You'd never know the lamb. You'd know the healer. You'd know the deliverer. You'd know the savior. But you'd never know the lamb without the cross. Does that make sense? I mean, you, you know, the lamb is manifested there at the cross where you see absolutely what are the issues of his being and the length to which, uh, and I'll say it like this, love goes, but not sloppy agape love, not that, you know, oh, I'd go to these lengths for you. No, the, the, the substance of God is most personified in that kind of that degree of self-giving and selflessness even for the worst of enemies the ones who hated him the ones who killed him the ones who mocked him the ones who put their blame on him you, you see you see that's the kind of love i'm talking about i'm not talking about us feeling good about something or oh i can't believe he went to this length for me he went to that length to show you him. Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. Actually, didn't know that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so that's demonstrating it. He was manifesting his love, not how much he loves us, but he was manifesting it toward us right. as a demonstration on our behalf, not how much he loves us. Right. But he's trying to define it for us. Yes. And, and that's, that's really what we're talking about right here. <clears throat> we're trying... Listen carefully. We're trying to find the definition of God as defined by Christ crucified. All right. Now, that's hard to do for most Christians because for them, the cross was one big event. Do you understand what I'm saying? I mean, it was just one big event, and we point to the event. 
But Paul, now listen to this. Paul is not, he is really breaking with that concept. He is really trying to put forth, this wasn't just a big event. This was the open heaven to mankind to come to grasp God, who is love. God, though. God, a definition of God. Because when we say love, we mix it all up. You understand what I'm saying? God. There's your true definition. Well, what about when he, he walked the shores of Galilee? No. Well, what about when he fed the 5,000? No, no, you don't even come close yet to seeing him. There had to be such a catastrophic event of Calvary and of, of vicious forces coming against him and of, and of false accusations so deep and so wrong against one who never sinned and yet heaping all sin upon them before we would ever, ever glimpse God in his most purest form. All right, so uh, so the lamb, had there never been a cross, everything that Jesus did would still have fallen short of revealing God. Okay? All right. Now, Lord willing, we'll continue to bring this out as we go. I don't just want to stay on that for right now. Um, so let me read it again, then we'll move on. He saw the cross as the way God chose to express love, and that's, that's it. See, I want to give you an expression of real love, not fake love, not earth love, not human love, okay? He didn't just say, I want to love you. He said, I want to, sh like what Mallory just shared, I want to give you a true expression of love. This is it. And then how did I write that? And Jesus told us to love one another as he's loved us. Now, you know, I don't really remember a whole lot about the movie, The Passion of Christ. Some people say, well, you shouldn't go see that. It's, you know, every, everything wrong. Well, I went and saw it. And, uh, you know, I'm thinking, You know, I've seen movies that didn't include Jesus. But anyway, that's another story. Uh, and and the, the main part that I remember is that, and, and I only saw it once, and I've never really seen the whole thing through, so maybe, my, maybe the Holy Spirit was doing more work than the movie. Maybe, yeah, I don't know. But I, I, what I recall from it is that Jesus is, they're, they're beating him and they're blaming him and accusing them. And there are points along the way where it flashes back to where he's sitting at this communion table and they're all around him and it feels warm and they, they know that something important is happening and he's breaking bread and stuff and he says, love one another as I have loved you. And then it goes back to the real scene of what's happening to him. And, the, and that got me. I mean, I just went, we are so carnal. That's what I thought. I thought we are so petty in our understanding that, that if we could, if that could have actually happened, I mean, and it did to the disciples because Jesus said a lot of stuff to them they didn't get at the time, but later, they did. So imagine if you're standing there and you're watching him go through this and you're comprehending that he is willingly doing this and, and it's just the way that his being is, not just for you, but just the way that his being is. And you flash back to that special moment and you go, oh my God, do you have, you know, I mean, it's like turning to the disciples next to you and say, do you, do you have any idea when he broke that bread what was in his mind? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? This is my body which is broken for you. And we go, oh, click, you know, if it's a little harder, click, you know. You know, we go, oh, thank you, Jesus. And we take the bread and go, oh, 
a little salty, but good. You know, we're, we're so religious and, you know, we're floating in the clouds with all this stuff instead of any kind of reality. And, and, and hearing the soft tones of his voice, love one another as I have loved you. We go, yeah, we're going to really love each other after you're gone. Don't worry, Jesus. We're going to just really hug and little sweet of you. I just love you, <laughs> you know. Because uh, that's what we're getting when he says, I love one another as I've loved you. Well, you've been really sweet to us, and we'll be sweet to one another. Yeah. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about love in the manner that I love. Yes. To the length that I love. Yes. And do it for one another. And let it be your way. That shall, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, because... You preach the right message because you love one another. You can preach Christ crucified and still maybe he doesn't recognize you as a disciple. Some angels say, hey, there's one of your disciples. He goes, which one? Well, come on, Lord, you know everything. It's the guy that's preaching you right there. And he goes, oh, I don't, that's not the basis upon which I know him as my disciple, you know. And well, I'm not going to say more on that. Sound like Forrest Gump. Well, that's all I'm going to say about that. Okay, all finds its central example and explanation in Christ crucified. Now that, you know, that's kind of like the statement Jesus sitting there at the communion table saying, I don't think we get it all, finds its central example and explanation in Christ crucified. That is a challenging statement. I know we can hear these things in general, but all? Yes, all. God brought everything together at that one moment, and he hung between heaven and earth, and there was the explanation of all things, particularly as from God. But in an, in an attempt to keep this concept referred to as Christ crucified out of the realms of the ambiguous, Philippians chapter 2 gives us and them the example of Jesus' life found in verse 6 through 8. As Christians, your definition of the Christian life is supposed to be Christ crucified. Now, uh, you see, I'm not. If I'm insane, I'm not the only one. I know I'm a dreamer. But I'm not the only one. And I know I'm insane, but I'm not the only one. Because there was this guy named Watchman Nee, and he wrote a book called The Normal Christian Life, and you ought to read it. What do you think it talks about? Oh, about going to church and reading our Bible and praying. The Jews did all of that before Jesus ever came along. Why is that now the, the mode for the Christian life? The model, or the, the explanation, the definition. Because if it's the definition, then we're all Jews because... It was happening before that. The model that, well, if by Watchman Nee's book, is Christ crucified. Is Christ crucified. And he calls it the normal Christian life. Well, it's not so normal in the world, is it? It's abnormal. That means if you believe this and follow this, you are considered abnormal by, by other Christians. Are you up for that? Most of you in here shouldn't have any problem with that. You've been considered abnormal long before you met Jesus, but that's another story. <clears throat> I don't know why you're looking sad over that. You know, <clears throat> um, As Christians, your definition of the Christian life is supposed to be Christ crucified. He tells them what to do concerning a course of action, but all is based on Christ crucified, meaning... In verse 1, or, or, uh, or in verse uh, 3 and 4, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, each esteem other. Look not every man on his own thing, but the things of others. 
he is telling them what to do, but that's verse 3 and 4, but in verse 5, 6, 7, and 8, he's going to say, but you can't do it. It doesn't just come by copying. It is what you're supposed to do. Yes, it is the, this, this is the true example, but it's not carried out by trying to copy the example. It is carried out by, get ready, the help of God. No, Christ crucified. Christ crucified. Because what does he go into in the very next verses? Let this mind be in you. This is his exam. This is his ex way of expressing it. This is this. He's driving the car here, and he ends up in the terminal of Christ and Him crucified. Where would you end up? Where do most people end up? Well, I don't know. I don't even care. I mean, not not that I'm uncaring, but it meaning it doesn't matter, or as they say in Spanish, no importa. Well, that doesn't mean it's not important. The way they mean that is it's, there are other things that are more important. Therefore, this is the explanation. This is the point of focus. Um, all right. So we're, we, will, we will spend several different sessions bringing up this point again because it's so important about the, the example as opposed to the pattern and how, how you don't live the example. You see the example and understand that the pattern, if it's truly Christ crucified, will manifest in like manner. Does that make sense? I hope so. But anyway, we'll have more explanation on that. All right. Um, so we just... Uh, well, let me just read some more here. Now, in order to better help us to understand Paul's definition of Christ crucified as given in this book of the Bible, we must discover the pattern by which it operates. All right, so here we go. To describe this pattern, we must first offer up a crude example pertaining to the world system. The economies of different countries are validated by the type of currency that they agree upon as valid. There is the dollar, the pound, the euro, the yen, etc. Each nation's economy rises or falls based on the strength of that currency and how valid it is to other people. Because if, if, you're, if, you're if your nation chose a currency and the other nations didn't accept it, it's just paper then or metal. Does that make sense? I mean, if they don't recognize your currency and think that it's valid, then then you have nothing. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> God's economy is based on a specific currency also. It is not an actual monetary amount, but it is still the gold standard of heaven. If I may put it this way, the, uh, the kingdom of God is founded upon a coin that God values above all other types of exchange. That coin has two sides, right? That coin has two sides. Well, one side we call one side we call heads. The other side we call tails. The interesting thing about a coin is. You can't really confront both sides at the same time, but they are one in the same, even if one's heads and one's tail. All right? The other aspect pertaining to the coin is that the, heads, the head side is positive. And the tail side is negative. All right. This is important because what, um, what we are going to discover from Paul's presentation of Christ crucified is that it, this coin, this Christ crucified, always has a negative and always has a positive side. Always. There's always, uh, and, it's, and it's one coin that has these two aspects.
And these aspects are the pattern. I haven't fully explained it yet, but these aspects are the pattern. Okay. Hang with me. We're, we're, we're heading, we're driving into the fog. I know, but we're, we're fixing to see it. <clears throat> um, uh, <clears throat> the heads or positive side relates to what you do. Okay, that's very important. It relates to do. Right. The head side relates to what you do, and the tail side relates to what you don't do, or shouldn't do, or shall I say it in the truth context of the truth, wouldn't do. But the pattern, if the life is not manifest in us, the pattern guides us toward it like a beacon until, because you don't just wander around any old where trying to get hold of Christ crucified. There is a pattern of Christ crucified that is eternal, and this is the part that I hope and pray, but I, I don't know that I will get the opportunity. But if I could, if we can just go long enough here, and I don't think we're supposed to go another semester, but if we could go long enough to be able to show you in, in all of these different books and all these different chapters, the same thing, the same pattern that is undeniable, and that's why I'm saying it's the most important thing class that I've ever taught, um, because the Lord showed it to me, and then the Lord showed me the pattern, and then the Lord took me to a walk through the scriptures and blew my mind. So much so it's like math. Not that we, you know, it's like, man, I hate math. Don't hate math. Remember, math counts. Anyway, so, so start registering this. The head side of the coin the head side of the currency that God validates has to do with positive aspect and has to do with what you do. The tail side has a negative connotation only in the sense of what you don't do. Okay? And in this currency that God accepts, Listen carefully. He never accepts one side of the coin above the other or, or only one side. Never. Never. No. Because it's not truly the currency that he is offering or expects if we're only given one side. <clears throat> All right. Um, as found in Old Testament types and shadows, we discover that gold represents deity. Is that true? Gold represents deity or God. That means, because, because gold, you know, we talked about the gold standard. Well, look at the gold standard right now in the U.S. It's just incredible. Well, it's not just in the U.S., it's in the world. It's sky high because there's nothing more valuable or higher validated by men than gold. And for God, there's nothing higher than that which proceeds from Christ. All right. So let me read this again. As found in Old Testament types and shadows, we discover that gold represents deity. That means that what is of eternal value is out from God himself and finds him as their source. For example, what gives this coin value in our lives is that it is carried out through us by deity, Christ in us, the gold standard. But it's carried out by Christ crucified. The true Value is only valued in terms of Christ crucified, not some ethereal Christ that we have set above God's 
standard. All right. I know that you, know, you don't have to understand all that. Since it is Christ based upon the value of his nature to God the Father, then it always manifests in a golden way. In other words, there is a pattern. It, it, there is a golden way, a true pattern that validates that this is true gold. Okay? What I mean is that there is a distinct pattern that validates whether it is truly gold, Christ, or fool's gold, us. Anybody ever heard of fool's, fool's gold? You know, growing up, we used to find it in creeks and stuff like that. And come home, we found gold. We're rich. We're, we're this little poor family with six kids. You know, we're rich. Oh, that's fool's gold. What you talking about, fool? <laughs> All right. So we're going to um, we're going to introduce it now in the scriptures. This is still not the full picture. This is the example, and not yet the pattern. But it gives us the picture of the pattern. It's our first true step into the pattern. All right? Verses 3 and 4. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem others better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. All right. Again, this, this will be expanded in verses 5 through 8. It also... Um, It also will be given more of the true emphasis by declaring Christ in verses 5 through 8. But Paul had to bring them in, and he brought them in through these scriptures, okay? Um, so, let's see. Maybe I should, even though we got a bunch of mics here, maybe I can just pop this one out. All right. The first part of this is, and this is the beginning of the pattern, okay? Okay. Excuse me a second while I write this. There's more to write, but I don't want to take all of our time. Okay, the tail side is being described here. And what I want to tell you is, God showed me this pattern over and over and over throughout the New Testament. So much, so often, that it is undeniable. It's like, you know, science. Once, once you can predict something, you know you're on the right track. It is incredibly verifiable over and over and over. Um, and I have the benefit of having seen that. You don't yet, so you're just going to have to bear with me. All right. Do nothing, okay? Do nothing. Tail side, that's a negative. Don't do something. Do nothing, right? You, you see how that's the tail side? Through selfish ambition or conceit. You see that there? Do nothing. That's the key. That's the, th that's the key. It's good that I left out writing selfish ambition or conceit because this pattern will say any number of things fill in the blank. But when it comes to the negative side of the coin, it'll say don't do this. All right? Do nothing through this, but, all right, the but, and there's always a but at the end of that to lead you to the other side of the coin. Always. There's always that, okay? But do, okay? And I, in my little chart, I wrote do, and in parentheses, uh, of course, th this is the head side. Do regard 
others better than yourself. That's verse 3. Okay? So is everyone sort of at least starting to familiarize yourself with it? Okay, verse 4. Look not... Okay, what side of the coin is that? That's the tail side, okay? Look not on our own interests, but, and it always leads to this, it's telling you what you will not do by Christ crucified and what you will do, okay? It is giving such a clear pattern and a definition that you cannot go wrong. And again, this, this is not fully seen in verses 3 and 4. We have to wait to see it in Christ crucified in the next couple of verses. But that's where he got it from. That's where he got it from. Okay, And that's why I said, you know, let us have the same mind, the same love. And then he just comes out and says, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Okay. All right. So um, look not, but look, look to the interest of others. Okay. All right. That's the pattern in the simplest form. In the next few verses, when we get into it, we'll see how, um, how Paul develops this so that we can see beyond just uh, moral codes delivered. Look not, look to, do you understand what I'm saying? Just religious... Um, uh, Moral ethics. He's not delivering. It looks like that in verse 3 and 4 until he mentions Christ and him crucified. Do you see how he could, it would look that way. Well, then I'm just supposed to act this way. No, 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 no. You must let this mind be in you. That's your key in. If you don't do that, none of this is valid, even if you do it. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? But it's the absolute truth. All right. With this example, we're given a brief picture of what the coin entails. It involves a two-sided coin. One side describes what is done by us and is seen as dealing with the positive aspects of the pattern. The other side entails what is refrained from and deals with negative attributes. Briefly, we might say that in the economy of God, what is looked down upon, now this is early, I know I may be too early introducing this, but I'm going I'm to go ahead and read this. Briefly, we might say that in the economy of God, what is looked down upon is what satisfies self, and what is approved involves actions that benefit others. I know that's a generalized statement with no explanation of verses 5, 6, 7, and 8, but it is a true statement in the economy of God, in the economy of God. It is a true statement because... Because Christ is the fulfillment of that spirit. Let this, and, and if you remember in one of our other classes, the word mind there isn't even the true Greek word. Let this attitude be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. So it's not talking about knowing deep knowledge stuff. It's talking about the attitudes that took Christ to the cross, not just the attitudes of Christ in general, and then let's just point to any old thing and call it Christ. No, the attitudes that took Christ to the cross and in this economy, what satisfies self is what is looked down on. And, and you know, I know these are rough statements at this stage of the game, but we'll see the, how this pans out in the truth of God. And then, um, but the pattern is not just about what you do by acts of your own strength and resolve, but is produced by Jesus' crucified mind at work in you. All right. So the next class we'll get into uh, comparing verses 3 and 4 with verses 6 through 8. 
and we'll compare those so that we can see, number one, the same pattern, but we'll, we'll see more than the same pattern. We'll see the source. We'll find the source and why what appears as moral codes throughout the New Testament is really Christ crucified. All right? Let's pray. Father, we just ask you to continue to open our hearts to you, to you, to you. Father, um, you've dealt with me for a lot of years, and you're just now breaking through on certain things. So I put no expectations on your people. I put no pressure. I, I only teach this class at the behest of the Holy Spirit and for his purposes, whether it be to release the truth and in seed form so that these seeds come up later in people or just ground here may not be able to receive it, but you want me to uh, help get it more in me by speaking it forth. Whatever your, I don't know your fullness, but I know that I'm with you, and I know that I believe this with all my heart, and that you've changed me, and you've changed my view, and you've opened the Bible again, and given me a new Bible. And I ask you to be gracious to your people that are here and that are listening to this and that are watching this. Be gracious to them and lead them gently into the truth and let not their carnal minds raise walls of fear because the wording is yet new and, and we haven't gotten deep enough to give full explanations for everything. So be gentle, O oh good shepherd with your sheep and continue to guide me as an under shepherd to not just deliver in word but in spirit and in heart the things that are on your heart. Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we're dismissed.